How about that? Okay, so we're back here for um, season two, episode two, live from the drum room, from my drum room. My guest today is my old buddy, Danny Serafin, who, um, well, I won't take a lot of time talking about Danny because he doesn't really need much of an introduction. I will just say, for anybody who doesn't know this, Danny is a uh, founding member, the original drummer and a founding member of the hugely popular band Chicago. Um, but I think anybody watching this probably knows that already. So, um, all right, I'm going to bring Danny on. He's one of my oldest and dearest friends, known him for 35 years. And uh, I'm so glad to have him here. And I'm so glad to see you guys watching. Got a lot of folks already. That's great. And uh, here comes Danny. All right. From the waiting room. And there he is. Hey, Johnny. How you doing? Good, Danny. It's good to see you, brother. You too, my friend. You too. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for uh, taking some time to do this. For any, anybody um, you're tuning in at home, Danny played some golf today and managed to uh, squeeze this into a busy day. He's got something else happening later. So um, it's just nice that you made time to do this. Oh, of course. Anything for you, brother. Anything. Thanks, brother. Thank you. I, you know, I was setting this up ahead of time, Danny. I've told you this story and I, and I, I completely understand that you don't remember it because you meet a lot of people in your life, but I met you 35 years ago, right about this time when I moved to Los Angeles in 1985 to work for Simmons. Right. And I tell this story I and mean, we got to know each other better at, at DW a couple of years later when you signed right. on as a DW guy. But um, I tell this story <laughs> <laughs> and I know you think I'm crazy, but I remember you coming to Simmons and it was like August or September it was hot outside and you were living in Westlake. So you live close to Calabasas and yeah. you looked like a, like a pro tennis player. It's the only way I can describe it. You came in like in, in like a white tennis shirt, you know, really good shape. I feel like you were wearing like white shorts. In those days and, I was playing tennis. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. And I was, I was, the golf. <laughs> <laughs> I was so starstruck. I remember just, you know, like you were, I'm not saying this, you were the first of my heroes that I got to meet, you know, when I moved out oh, there. Thanks, but, Jenny. Yeah, well, now was, you're my hero. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> retired, living in uh, Martha's Vineyard, you know, it's pretty amazing, you know, it's uh, well, you know, that's, that's a feat un unto itself, you know? Well, thanks my friend. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I just uh... <laughs> I know. I feel the same way when you say that. So, but uh, you know, I, I mean that uh, you're you're a great great friend and I have great admiration for you. So, thank you. But... Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to see I'm, I think we got some uh, some folks watching and see if there are any questions off the bat and we're going to just chat. My cousin Karen's watching. Oh, hi, hi Karen. He says, "Hi Karen. How about that?" See, see the things I do for my family. <laughs> Got Danny Serafin to say hi to my cousin. Um, one of the things too, Danny, I want to just, um, I want to tell people about this book if they haven't oh, bought okay. it or don't know about it. I know it's a few years old now. It came out I in 2010. It. It's, uh, it's 10 years old. 10 years old. Wow. It's Man, that's crazy. I know. I, 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 time flies way, way too fast. It goes by way too fast. It sure know? does. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking like 2004. 14 or something but um, no i'm almost I, you know i i think it what does it say in the book it would say the copyright yeah, i think right. it's 2010 i think you're it's right. 2010 i could be wrong i mean uh you're right you signed it in 12 yeah. for me 12 yeah august yeah. 6th you know what i think when you played here in situate at heritage days yeah but CTA. i think it had already been out i think it was 10 2010 when it came out i'm not but i'm not disputing the author yeah it says copyright 2011 but you probably wrote it in 10 yeah. Okay. 11. You telling okay, me it came out yeah. at 11 then, I guess. Yeah. Man, it's a great, great book. It's, a, I just, I've been reading a lot during the lockdown and uh, lots of great books. And I, I think I'm going to read this one again. I mean, I read it, I don't know how many years ago, but it's um, a lot of great background and history. And yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I missed the, the, uh, the, 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 the Facebook live with Steve. That would have been fun, but uh, yeah. you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do it that day. Not without well, every, uh, getting yeah. in trouble. I was going to say, I, 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 th I think everybody knows from my Facebook post last week, it was Danny's birthday on Friday, right? The mm -hmm. 28th. 
and his family came in. Danny lives in Las Vegas now with his wife, Pamela, and uh, his family came in from like LA and parts all over. Yeah. But actually and, uh, I was in Santa Barbara. Oh, you were? Oh. I like you. I, 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 I do some, I, I went to Santa Barbara for the month of August while you were in Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> or didn't you, go this, you didn't go this year, did you? I did. I went, we, we didn't go for a long time. I'm home now in situate, but yeah. we, um, we were there. Grandkids came down for a couple of, for three weeks, actually at, oh, at great. different points. So that was great. And that was pretty much it. You know, we were there for, might go back in a few weeks, but you know, it's just, it's different this year. So. Yeah. But you got to kind of enjoy when you can. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, but talking about Steve, we had a great hang with Steve and, um, he told a great story about renting your house in Hawaii, in Kauai. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he just today texted me and said, say hi to Danny and and tell that story about how I rented his house in Kauai. So, or don't forget yeah. to mention he said, so. I miss that house, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a well, lot of regrets. In, that's I don't have a lot of regrets in life, but I regret selling that one. Yeah. But, you know, it's still, it's, it was great, great memories. And, you know, it was a yeah. great place. It was a great place to hang. Let me tell you, it's just beautiful. Well, Steve described it pretty nice. And look, look at look at that wall of fame behind you, though. I, I, I remember the first time I came to your house in Westlake in yeah. 1987, and it was just, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, Pamela, that's Pam, Pamela did this room. Uh, she did it. Look at what she did. I mean, it's amazing. Got to have a, my pool table. Uh, yeah, it's a wall of fame. It's a, a lot of great memories and it's a great place to come hang. And the, we got like, because we have a pool table, people love, it's a good, it's a great place to congregate. Yeah. Yeah. I'll so bet. you have to come to, I, I, I don't know if you, you probably don't come to Vegas much, but if you do, you have well, to come visit. I absolutely, but we haven't been in a long time and, and, you know, we, I'm sure at some point we'll find ourselves back there. Um, yeah. It is Las Vegas after all. So, yeah. But <laughs> I mean, the, the, strip, the strip is open. There's no entertainment yet, though. That's yeah. the thing. There's no entertainment. Yeah. That's got to be tough. That's, I mean, I mean, it's affecting so many yeah, people. I mean, it's affecting. It's it's amazing how it's how many people it's affecting. Yeah. You know, it's just. But there's not. You know, we're all the the. the you know, you start feeling sorry for yourself, or get angry, and then you realize everybody's going through it one form yeah. or another everybody's having to deal with it and it's it's a very it's a crazy time and then you put in the craziness from the elections which is going to be really crazy that's good the elections are going to be nuts but i know, I know. hopefully you know i mean hopefully i mean everybody should just get out and vote and have their, their say and then yeah let's see what right. happens you know? that's right I got to tell you, Danny, um, Pat Brown, your old friend, Pat Hi. Brown from Promark, uh -huh. says hello and uh, says, looking good, Danny. <laughs> and Eggy Castillo. No, thank you. I, tell him I miss him. I want to see him. Uh, does he still live in Houston? I assume so. Yeah, I, I assume Pat's still in Houston. Uh, and he'll see this comment. And Eggy Castillo sends you a big hug. Oh, I love Eggy. Uh, yeah, Eggy. Man, one of my favorite people. And what an amazing percussionist, right? Great percussionist. Great percussionist. Yeah. Great guy, and uh, our our friend Ralph Angelillo from Montreal oh, Drum wow. Fest. Yeah. yeah, so you got a lot of a lot of folks watching. Um, I love, Ralph is a great great guy. Uh, I don't. I, I wish he still did the Montreal Festival. It was one of the best. You know, he moved it up to um, uh, Ottawa. Yet yeah, or or um, not Ottawa, but Ralph. Sorry, help me out on this one, Ralph. If you're if you're watching this, he's going to tell me in one second. Uh, 2016, you had fun. He, but he, he had it going for a couple of years, and I think this year it's obviously it's off. But everything's off. <laughs> <laughs> Not, yeah, everything yeah. is off. Yeah, yeah. Pat says still in Houston. Um, well, Danny, let's talk for a minute. I mean, you know, this, this, there's not to get into all the um, Quebec City. Sorry, Ralph says Quebec City. Yeah, Quebec yeah. City. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I did. I played it. He had me there. I think it, I thought it was Ottawa, but it's it's Quebec City. Beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah, I yeah. loved it. That's right. It was maybe two years ago, 2018. I think so. Yeah. 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 That's well, right. I had a great okay. time. Yeah, I heard the venue is great. Well, hopefully, 
we'll all make it back there. Um, but I was just going to say, so, so, I mean, I, I think people probably know your history, but I wanted to talk a little bit about like how you got started, um, started as a self-taught drummer initially, right? I mean, just. Well, no, I mean, I, I took some lessons early on for fun and really kind of fundamentally set me up well. And yeah. I was, I was really into Gene Krupa at a young age. So that kind of fundamentally set me up in an advanced way. And so yeah. it also put me in a traditional grip, you know, which I'm still today. And I, I played a good amount of match, but yeah. it just, uh, but the lessons I took, because I had a pretty good teacher, not well known, but I remember him being really good and inspiring me. And, and then he, he moved out of the area and the next guy I got was terrible. So then I went on my own for quite a few years until um, I plateaued about 15, 15 and a half, 16, maybe I was 17. At 17, I kind of plateaued. And the Walt, Walt Perzader, the you know, co-lead founder of Chicago with me, was going to DePaul University. And, and, and he, he brought, he invited Bob Tillis, who was a really renowned you know, percussionist, teacher, yeah. really yep. renowned educator, and, and, and rightfully so. So he brought him to see the band one night. We were playing a club in Chicago, and he transcribed. We were doing I'm a Man without the drum solo because we didn't do the drum solo in those days. Come, and, and he transcribed my part, and he said, do you realize you're playing? Wow, I said, really? <laughs> you know, and he said, he said, you know, he said, I'd really like to work with you, and I really think I can help you. And I said, yeah, sure. I mean, I was kind of at that point really into, I, I kind of had felt like I'd taken it as far as I needed some help. Yeah. And then I, st I, I hadn't, I quit high school. So I certainly couldn't go to DePaul University because he was the head of percussion at DePaul. But he took me on as a private student. You know, I'd come, you know, once or twice a week after school and work with him. And he just turned me around upside, he turned me upside down. Mm -hmm. It was great what he did. And, uh, he, he recognized what I was really trying to do, which was um, fuse jazz and rock, you know? And it, he, he really pushed me in that direction and developed me in that direction and nurtured, nurtured, my, nurtured me. And, and, you know, he saw the potential and he really shaped me. And he, he changed, took me from a good rock punk drummer to a, a really fine musician mm. and that just transformed me um and to this day i mean i'm always be great he was a wonderful man too i mean i used to just love love studying with him and been practicing and then coming back and learning more um you know i think that i know steve i know all the guys would tell you that there's there, when you get a chance to study with the masters you do it yeah it's just yeah you know, the master teachers and the master players, um, they're kind of two different things. Master teachers are just guys that aren't necessarily master players, but they're just inspiring teachers, great teachers, you know. And he was one of those. Yeah, yeah. And I studied with Papa Joe Jones, who was a master player. Yeah. And, you know, and I mean, that was an amazing experience as well. And I studied with yeah. Chuck Flores, in LA when I first went to California and he was a master player and teacher. I mean, really, again, he saw, he knew what I was striving for and he developed aspects of my playing to complement what I was striving for, which was great. He really helped me develop my foot. You know, in those days it was single pedal. And, uh, yeah, there wasn't, and, and there wasn't a double pedal. I mean, there were double bass drum, and I eventually kind of morphed into double bass drum for one reason or another. Not quite sure for solos, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, he taught yeah, you how to do they, those those flutters in old days. Those little, yeah, yeah, little, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a single pedal. It yeah. Was just, yeah, yeah, that was a single pedal. That's a, that's. I don't know that I could play that today. Honestly, I, you know, not exactly, but, but yeah, that's a pretty amazing bass drum part. It sure is, man. But, but that was Chuck Flores. That was due to Chuck Flores. He really had me doing exercises that could 
that helped me, you know, pull stuff like that off. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, you know, I mean, you made an excellent point about, you know, master drummers, master teachers, and it's, it's, you know, there's so many great guys that can do one or the other. And, uh, but, you know, there's not a lot of guys that you'd call like a master teacher and player. And like, I think of a guy like Alan Dawson yeah. from, here in Boston, you know, oh, that, gosh, yeah. yeah, Alan and, uh, and Joe Picaro, our good friend, Joe Picaro. Rest yeah, in peace. Was was, yeah, it was a great, I got to I did, study I with Joe too. Joe was a great teacher and a great teacher. Yeah. Inspiring yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, so, so, so talking about then, so I, and I've never asked you this, so did you write a lot of the, did you write charts for a lot of those parts in those Chicago songs? Like, um, or did, did you have a sort of a little cheat sheet chart when you were playing? Cause well, some Jimmy, of those arrangements uh, are. Depends who the, Jimmy's, Jimmy tend, tend to write stuff out more. He didn't really write out drum parts, but he would do rhythm charts mm. with the horn kicks, things like that. And Robert, Robert was more free form, looser. Uh, it sounded like there were charts at Robert's, but there really weren't. Sometimes I'd look at the charts, like because some Robert actually wrote a lot of the brass for the songs he wrote, and then Jimmy would voice it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I just assumed Jimmy really, wrote the parts. Uh, yes, there were some charts, and um, but did I write them out? No, I didn't. Um, not really. I might have done some, but pers- but what's the matter? Kelly, Kelly just popped her head at the top. What's up, honey? What time is your broadcast uh, wrapping up? As long as I can keep Danny on, oh, probably okay. five o'clock. Tell him I said hi. Kelly says hello, Danny. Send her a big hug for me. I'll give her a big hi, hug. Kelly. You just, I think you just saved me from a honeydew. So, Okay. <laughs> I remember that um, lobster, that, that fresh lobster she got me. That was so good. I that was. Hello. <laughs> he says hi, honey. <laughs> um, that was, we had a great lobster dinner on the vineyard. That was amazing. Oh, yeah. 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 We had a few of them, you know. So, anyways, the truth, the answer is, is there was a combination of, you know, in those days, we really rehearsed a lot. And so I could, I, quite often, I got to really learn them by memory, you know, and that's always the best way. And then sometimes it was just really off the cuff quickly, you know, um, and I would I would look at the horn chart to see if I wanted to kick something to read it. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it was different ways, but there, you know, Jimmy Panko was probably the most organized and uh, as far as getting charts together. Yeah. Hey, John, would you mind if I put an iced coffee together? Go ahead, Danny. Go ahead. Yeah, go while, ahead. We, while we're doing this and put a nice coffee this. together. Yeah, because I'll entertain I'm, the I, I got up like I woke up at five o'clock, five a.m., and I was in the sun, and I'm like, I'm starting to fade. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be a. I don't want to be a. So I'm gonna have. I'm gonna. I'm gonna turn the lights on so you can watch me. That's it. So you know what, I'm not. What do you have for a coffee maker over there? You have a. You got an oh, espresso I, or. Oh, it's it's called a euro. It's really great. It's fabulous. Oh yeah, fabulous. I had one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, to see? crush the beans for you to grind the beans. Oh yeah, yeah. Can you see it? Here I it can is. See it. Yeah. I had yeah. I had a euro years ago. You know, I'm I'm sold on Nespresso, man. I, I uh, I've had this one that I have now for eight years, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, and it's great. But anyway, I I had a question. Question was directed to me from my friend Penny Lane. Um, asking what, oh, what a cool, what a cool name, Penny Penny Lane. That's a great Penny name. Lane. Hold on one second. I'm getting some water. Okay. I, I so can Penny, hear you though. I, I can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. So Penny, to answer your question, what does my shirt say? It's a it's a brand of vodka called Volstead vodka, and it says no gluten, no Putin. Volstead <laughs> vodka. It's gluten free vodka. But is it Putin? Yeah, and so if anybody here is a fan of Putin, I apologize if this offends you, but you can, if you are a fan of Putin, you might want to tune out right now. Um, That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, So that's what it says. I like Putin. I like him. You like Putin? I do. I think he's a a character. You know, he's he's an acquired taste. He's an acquired taste, John. 
All right, I mean, well, we'll, Kenny, we'll have a we'll have a conversation about that offline. Hey, there's Chris Brady right there. Chris Chris Brady's tuned in as well. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey. <laughs> it's okay if I do my coffee. Yeah, do your coffee. Go ahead. I'm going to keep talking. I'm going to ask you some questions. All right. Um, keep talking. So you mentioned Gene Krupa. Yeah, get oh, some Jesus. ice. Um, so Gene was like one of your first, maybe your first influence. Um, but I know Buddy came into the picture along the way. Yeah. Gene was first, though. Yeah. Yeah. And Sorry when you, do you remember, that's okay. Do you remember when you met Buddy? I know you you actually had a, a personal relationship with Buddy. You guys were friends. Yeah, the first time I met Buddy was at Dante's, a jazz club in Hall in uh, the Valley. John, I'm terrible with years. I mean, oh, it's wow. in the 70s. It was yeah, probably in LA. Yeah, it's probably 70, 70, 5, I don't know, John. I lose track of time. But all yeah. I know is Kathy was 16. That's all I know. So if we took Kathy's age and minus and put her at 16, that would be the year. And okay. she'd probably be able to answer that now if she's listening. But I, and so I got to meet Buddy, and it was just what a thrill. And that was before he talked about me, I think. Right? Okay. But he really well, loved the band. He loved yeah. the band. He had, he had done a review. He had done a review in, in the Melody Maker, or whatever, the, an English publication, right? He, Buddy, Buddy slammed Ginger and praised me, right? He said, he said, Ginger Baker sounded like somebody falling down the stairs with a timpani, which was terrible. I didn't oh agree. My gosh. <laughs> but, oh my God. I didn't, yeah, I Buddy didn't remember tough. that. But it could be really tough, but I was one of the lucky ones you know, because he, he liked me. He liked my playing, you know, and, and he could hear, I mean, first I forget my ear pods and everything. He, he's, you know, he, he could hear, I'm sure he could hear. I mean, I was at that point, uh, Bob Tillis turned me on to Buddy. Bob Tillis was the guy that turned me on to Buddy. And yeah. um, so, you know, I loved Buddy. And who didn't? But, and I was striving, always, like, for instance, when we did that song introduction of our first album, I, I really thought, okay, how would Buddy play this? You know, um, how would Buddy do this? How would Buddy set this up? How would Buddy, you know? So I was a, I was a Buddy freak, like, like so many, so many people, right? And um, this will help me, by the way. This will wake me up. Good. Well, I while you're I while you're drinking a, your I don't coffee. Want to be a dud on your show. No, while you're drinking your coffee, I can tell everybody I was watching the Tonight Show. I don't know. I, I want to say it was in the mid '70s. I was a teenager, and it was a big deal to stay up that late to watch Johnny Carson on a school night, you know. And 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 usually Buddy would come on like toward the end of the show. In those days, it was a 90 minute show, so you'd have to wait till almost one o'clock in the morning to see Buddy. And I and you know my my mom would let me stay up that late. At, but he was on. I remember watching it and Johnny asked him who he thought the top five drummers in the world were. And I remember he said, Louis Belson. No, he, this is what he said. He said, well, me, meaning himself, <laughs> Louis Belson, Ed Shaughnessy is a nod to Ed, who is the yeah. house drummer, you know, for the Tonight Show, Danny Serafin and Bobby Columbi. And I remember I went like, wow, you know, I, it was just a, it was, I mean, I was such a huge fan of yours at that yeah. point. I was, you know. I was floored too. I was, I was floored too. And I've never been able to find that segment. I've gone through, you know, someone sent me all of the, the Carson, you know, there's, there's Carson archives, right? Yeah. Never yeah. Been, and, and it's really weird. No one's ever been able to find it, but there's other things where he talked about me and Gad and, and, you know, yeah, it was yeah. an, an, an interview that, and, but that was like the greatest endorsement. Plus he talked, he talked about me in Downbeat Magazine. He did it. Um, so Buddy was, but and, and so people, a lot of, some people had trouble with him, but he was, he was so nice to me. I can't tell you how nice he was to me, John, and how cool he was. He was so, I mean, you know, Buddy just, just like you, you'd think he was, you know, witty and sharp, but, but, mm -hmm. but also pretty, very soulful. I mean, yeah, a lot of people, had a problem with him and he could be tough on people and, and he was, but he was always a gentleman with me. I mean, and, yeah, and yeah. Um, I think I was just really, I, maybe I was just lucky and, and, and 
because he, he was hard on drummers. He was hard on rock guys, especially. He was he yeah. brutalized yeah. Bonham, you know, and Baker, Ginger Baker. Like what I said, he's he he did a review of a of a of a blind faith Ginger Baker thing, and he said he said that uh, Ginger sounded like somebody falling on the stairs with timpanis. And I thought, oh my God, that's cruel, you know, because Ginger's a great drummer. I mean, you know, yeah, but. Yeah. And Bonham, he was really mean to Bonham, you know, but it, it, you know, but he went through a period where he was really tough on rock drummers. And then I think as he aged and towards the end, he really got, he got, he finally got really the approach to rock. And that was, that was insane because, you know, Buddy was so freaking good. I mean, oh, so, yeah, so freaking, yeah. and you know, people, people don't give him credit for enough credit is how great a feel he had. I mean, because yeah. I obviously I've yeah. done a couple of gigs with the Buddy Rich Band, so I really had to get inside his playing even more to try, because listen, I don't have the chops. I have pretty pretty good chops, but Buddy's chops were like otherworldly, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. I don't have that. Buddy had, had a gear that, no, that, you know, Billy Cobb might have it. Um, you know, Steve, Steve might have it, maybe. You know, Steve's got other things, you know, but yeah, yeah. But Buddy had a gear for a ferocity. He hit that gear that no one had. It would be like, oh my God, I want to quit. I'm going to quit right now. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm never going to play again. And, you know, then you had to say, okay, I'm just going to be my version of Buddy, or, you know, which is what I, I, I am today and what I was then is my version, a rock version of, of Buddy, you know. You know, without the, without the blazing chops, I had good chops, yeah. but I don't have the the blazing single strokes. You know, but I, you but, know, what uh, I think, what I think he heard in you and 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 Bobby, um, as as quote rock drummers is is the swing, especially you, not the and Bobby Columbia too, great drummer. Bobby, in his yeah, day. Bobby, Bobby was great in those days. Yeah, I absolutely. Really yeah, I was disappointed that he quit playing, but you know, he did great with whatever he did. Whatever Bobby did, he did well worked out for him but but i think i i think that's i mean i i made the connection immediately when he said that because i think he i think he heard a lot of himself and you guys not to say you guys <clears throat> were you know copying him but i think he heard a lot of um influence in in your playing of him and i think he you know i, I think he just he heard something that he could uh recognize and and relate to do you know what i mean like the um, and I and I will I totally agree about what you're saying about his feel. I mean I think people lose sight of the fact that you know you just people focus on his hands and his his chops and his just uncanny speed, but he could swing. I mean he had such oh, a great time yeah. you know ride ride beat in terms of like swinging a band. It was like yeah, his dynamics were, his dynamics were fabulous. Yeah, his dynamics were yeah. just uncanny. You know just yeah. and so. You and know, his instincts too, and, like for, for and, to, like, and and the great thing about it is I still listen to Buddy a lot, and everybody, a lot, all of us do, you know, listen to even the late yeah. great Neil Peart, who was you know such a great, great guy and a great drummer, you know, um, yeah, they, yep. you know, they're, they're but and then but, but Gene was the first guy, and I still hear, uh, if I when I go back and listen to like, like I'm a man, the solo no man, there's so many Gene Krupa licks in there. Um, and there's obviously somebody, uh, the make me smile drum thing, the four bar make me, that's Buddy and Gene and me, you know, my, my feel, um, you know, there's a lot. And then Hal Blaine, there was a lot of Hal Blaine, you know, and Mitch sure. Mitchell yeah. was, Mitch Mitch was a pretty major influence on me in a lot of ways. So. And he uh, talked about, I'm sorry, Steve talked about Mitch Mitchell the other day being a big influence as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was. You guys are coming up. I got to tell you, a couple of guys have commented about "Make Me Smile," just saying, you know, one of the greatest songs, one of the greatest drum breaks. Uh, and I would, I would <laughs> yeah, go along with that. Be, it turned out to be, I, but I have to say, I really did think about that and and think, well, what do I? I, I had an opportunity to do a four bars, you know, in a song that ended up being a, a radio hit, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, 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 I'm very proud of that and. Danny, did I lose you? John. Oh, there you are. A call, I I call, a call came in. You got me back. Oh, good. A call okay. come in for me. Maybe I wonder if I can block it anyway so it doesn't happen again. Um, 
Hold on one second. Well, hold on one second, John. Okay. This do not disturb. is a test. Um, hey, by the way, um, Marty Farah, Marty Farah says a big aloha oh, to us. Oh yeah, man, I love him. He's is he still? Ask him if he's still in Maui. I, I'm assuming he is. Marty, you're still in Maui. We're asking. Danny's asking. I'm asking. I, I believe he is. And Marty is also. Marty and I worked together at Simmons when I went to work there, and he was. Right. We we worked side by side for the first few days that I was there. One of the first buddies, that drummer buddies, I made when I started working there. So. He's a great yeah. guy. I love him. He's yeah. I do too. Great, great, great drummer too, man. What a what a great feel he has. Yep. I used to go up, see him play at, at uh, Pelican's Retreat with his band. Pelican's and, uh, Retreat. Oh my God. Remember that? Yeah. And Sagebrush Cantina. We'd go there after. Oh work. yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Those were fun times, man. I I hope that the you know I hope those those opportunities and venues open up again soon. I mean, soon as be, you know, because I know the canyons, I mean, sooner or later, these places have got to be able to open up or they're going to, they're not going to ever yeah. open up. I think, it's I think when there's, yeah, when there's a, a vaccine or, and or a cure or, you know, people are going to, everybody's going to feel safe about being in a room with a bunch of other people and those kinds of things that, at least around here, I don't see it happening until there's those kinds of things in yeah, place. Yeah, you know? I agree with you. It's, yeah. you know. I'm in Vegas where it really needs to be, right? Oh, man. I mean, yeah. it's Vegas completely. I mean, the, Vegas is open and a lot of people are coming. And I guess it, I've, Pamela was telling me that this, the cases are supposed to be spiking around here. I don't know, John. It's hard to keep track. I know I keep, I'm careful, but I live, I go out to the store, I, I play golf. I I don't get on airplanes much, but, you know, I drive to LA. I, you know, I yeah. refuse to hide in a hole. It's a drag. Just, mm-hmm. Yeah, just be careful. I I I, a, I hid in a hole for a while, but I'm I'm well, out I doing did stuff. And, I did too. Yeah. And I said, I said, I said, I'm not gonna say it. I said, you know what I mean? Yeah. I said, heck yeah. with heck with it. I'm gonna start living. It's not gonna be stupid. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. By the way, nice watch, Danny. I noticed your watch. Yeah, these are great. I, yeah. I love them. They yeah, Apple's a great, great company. Yeah. But did yours probably, come with a picture of my grandkids like mine did? Look at that. That's great. I need to get my grandkids on mine. Yeah. No, I need to do that. I'm sure that tell me how you show me how you did it later. I'll show you. It's easy. It's easy. But it's gonna be I'm gonna make you put my grandkids on your watch. That's that's oh, the only catch. Uh, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> my grandkids will they'll be mad at me, so you'll I'll have to and that's that. You have too many grandkids to put on your how many grandkids do you have now? Seven. Wow. God bless you, and God bless them, mm-hmm. man. We had them all together. Um, had them all together. This um, was nice for my birthday. It was great. They were all there. That's fantastic. That's that's what it's all about. That was, I mean, having having our grandkids down to the vineyard was that made I the bet, whole. Yeah, it's oh God, yes. Yeah, it, family is everything, especially at times like now. I mean, you know, you really, you really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Friends and family, you know. Well, the other thing I was going to mention, I, I saw that you're doing the Modern Drummer, the virtual MD festival this year in a couple of yeah. weeks, right? Yeah, I need to do, I need to do the, uh, my Neil Pert, you know, uh, not, you know, my interview about Neil Pert, so, and our friendship and, yeah, so it was a great loss. He was a really great guy. I really I know. Him. Really yeah. a sweet person. Yeah, he was. I, I got to know him you know, toward the end of his time that he was, you know, before he moved on from Zildjian. And, uh, you know, he wasn't a guy that, I'm sure you knew him better, but he wasn't a guy that he let a lot of people into his- Oh, no, no, house, he was pretty, he was very private. Very private, but- But, but once I he sort opened of, up here, he was great. Yeah, and we, we, you know, we'd have these great email exchanges and, and you know, he had a great sense of humor. And, um, you know, the last time I spoke with him was quite a long time ago now, but it was at Freddie Gruber's, um, memorial service that they had at, uh, you were probably there at uh, the place I used to stay, Sportsman's Lodge in LA. No, I was out of town. At that you were out of town. Okay. <clears throat> I flew in for it. And Neil was sort of like the MC of the day. And um, and he, he came outside. I was standing out there talking to somebody. He came over and, you know, made a point to come over and say hello. And 
you know, thanks for coming. I was hoping you'd make it out for this. And Freddie thought, you know, the world of you and just really. Yeah, him know. and Freddie were really close. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was. He, and he, it was, yeah, he was a good, good guy. It was a huge loss losing Neil. Yeah. You know, huge loss. Definitely. Yeah. It's, you know, and I, I'll just not to, not to harp on it, but it, you know, I think back to that, it was back in, I think January, right? It was before all this started and um, it just <laughs> the, the sort of the, the year just sort of went downhill after that, you know, it was, it yeah. was just, I mean, it was like Kobe Bryant, Neil kind of within the same week. Yeah. And then the, then the virus kind of reared its head and the lockdown happened and it just. I know that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, and just kind of write this year off, you know. Yeah. Um, anyway, hopefully not next year too, but part of next year too, probably. Yeah, I I think so. I think so. And 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 again, I don't I don't mean to sound like a downer because people are, people are probably watching this thinking, what am I doing watching this? These guys are. But you know, I think I think it's important to just to stay upbeat, and I and I know you have been, and I like you say you're getting out and doing stuff, and and I'm doing the same thing, and you, you got to do that. You got to keep your wits about you and um, yeah. have some some kind of normalcy, you know? Try to. Um, I agree. I agree. Do you have drums set up at your house? Well, you know, I don't. I got an electronic kit. Um, I got a, I just got a rolling kit. I, I, I don't have a drum room set up here yet. I don't, I've got to get one. I've got a drum set up in a, in a warehouse, but I've got a, uh, my office. Is, here's my office. Yeah, let's take a look. Here's my, but wait a minute, I'll show you this. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's fantastic, man. I remember that. There's my, my electronic kit, which is great. That's really kind of saved my ass, you know? Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, and I, but I need to get, uh, it, I had a great studio in LA. We haven't set one up here yet, but I'm going to, because it's just, uh, it's, we both really miss it. And my, my wife, Pamela, who's a great percussionist, and she misses it probably more than I do because she practices more than I do. You yeah. know, she yeah. really does. And I was going to try to, I think she's running out because she thinks I'm going to put her on the camera. Let's see. <laughs> Pamela, say hi to everybody. Say hi. Say hi. Say hi. How are you? Hi, Pam. How are you doing? Great. How are you? It's... I'm good. I'm just running to give uh, take our dog to the vet. So unfortunately, oh. I can't chat because I'm late for my appointment. <laughs> okay. I hope the it's dog's nice okay. Oh, it's, it's nice to see you. Too. She just has to get her shot. This is our doggy. Come here, honey. Say hi to everybody. Here. Here, say. Well. Everybody's going to have to take my word for it that Pamela is an absolutely beautiful woman. Danny's a very oh, lucky man. Thank you. I'm a welcome. very lucky man. All right, Darren, I'll see you later. Um, as you can see, John, full of surprises. <laughs> I won't take you to the bathroom with me. I promise you that. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. I should tell everybody this morning when when we we tried we did our little test with the video. Danny was, <laughs> Danny's laying in bed shirtless, yeah. and I'm thinking this I'm going to change really my shirt real quick, but I'm not going to do it in front of the camera. Hold on, just kind of you can tell the story. Okay. So, tell the story. Uh, no, when the camera came on, there was Danny, kind of like shirtless, you know, bare chested, from the waist up. But uh, he was getting ready to go golfing, so he was just kind of getting his day started. So anyway, that's the backstory there. I'm going to look and see if there are any questions that I can throw at Danny while he's <laughs> changing his shirt. Uh, my friend Michael Rogello, huge admirer. Congratulations on an incredible career. I steal and use many of your fills. Good man, Mike. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, I'm more comfortable now. I feel better. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Right. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. I'm looking to so see if you get any questions here, Dan. I'm going to show you around my house in Vegas. This is a, this is the entrance. This is kind of my billiard room with the, right? See that pool table? 
Oh Can yeah. You see? Here's a. My, it's part of the Pamela put this together. Look Here's at that. The, the Grammys, the new the new Grammy, the Lifetime Achievement. And let me take Look this off. I'm just gonna here. There's the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, let's see. I've, it's, I have to go. I'm trying to get this in so I can get it. There we go. There. And you can. Can you see him? Yeah. John? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and you, you see the Grammy. Yep. Uh, here's my my tequila collection. I have a good tequila collection. And Very whiskey. important to have. Yeah, whiskey. I just got some really good whiskey. The, this is called Angel's Envy. You familiar with it? No, no. It's I, really I don't good. It. It's really good. I don't drink a lot. It's just, you know, sometimes you're having a rough day, just a shot of whiskey. Yep. Um, uh, and this is all the all my gold and platinum records. Uh, I'm going to show you the pool. The pool is like the the pool is really the best part. I mean, it's so a very important thing to have in Las Vegas I, too. I, I got to be careful. What about what I do? Hold on. Whoop, John. I lost you. We lost you, Danny. Um, what happened? I must. Did you hit the camera button? Maybe there you are. You're back. Yeah. Okay. You're back. Okay. Okay. So sorry about that. Here's the look. The at backyard. That. Beautiful. There's the get John. When you come visit, there's the guest house. I love it. Okay. There's the, the pool is what the, the, the pool's phenomenal here. You got to have a pool in Vegas, especially in the summer. Otherwise, yes. you get that. So, okay. Come back. Beautiful. Yeah, and you can sit outside and and we can do the rest of the hang while you just relax by the pool. That's great. Yep. Yep. So it's going on two o'clock there. Yes, it's getting hot. It's getting real hot. It's, let's see, it's um, it's ninety six. Yikes! Wow. But ninety six here is comparable to about eighty five by you with the humidity. It's a big. It's, the dry heat yeah. is very different. In fact, eighty if you have eighty five with high humidity and situate, it's going to feel a bit more uncomfortable than ninety six dry here. It starts getting to hundred. 105, 110, then it's too hot. Yeah. And 96 is really actually bearable. Shit. Wow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you can say shit. It's okay. okay. I say it all the time. All right. Hey, Good. Danny, while, while, you're, while you're getting your phone sorted out, I have a question here uh, from Pepe Marola asking, was your drumming also inspired by Ike Day? Never, I never heard of Ike Day. Okay, I, I didn't either, and I didn't want to be a, a, a knucklehead. Um, no, I, I, friend... mean, I, I can't say that it wasn't. I don't mean to be ignorant at all, because he's probably a great drummer. Yeah. A couple more questions here. Yeah. Okay. These these are good. These are good questions. Is it okay um, if I'm moving around too? Because I. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's hard for me to sit still. I noticed. I, I know that about you. Even at seventy-two, you 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 spent three days at my house on the vineyard. I remember that. I couldn't I couldn't keep track of you. You couldn't, could you? <laughs> so Jimmy Allison is asking, what kind of a pedal did you use on twenty-five or six to four? I'm guessing it was a Slingerland pedal, but Slingerland, yeah. It was oh, a pedal. Like a Tempo a, King or whatever the pedal was. It was Yellow a, jacket? I don't know, but um, I used, in the early days, I used a Ludwig Speed King a lot, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm just getting a glass of water, Jeff. Okay. Um, my friend Nels Dealman asked if your legs ever, leg ever cramped up playing 25 or 6 to 4. No. No. Okay. Good. No, not 25. I'll tell you what it, what it would cramp up was when I would play that drum crazy bass drum part in the ballet where the ballet where the one movement where I'm playing the 16 no triplets uh, I think it's either but anyways that's that's where my leg would cramp up yeah. our friend Rob Winner from Oralex hi Rob is asking um, hey Rob I, he's a great guy I like he him. sure is 
Yep, he's a good guy. Asking, what was your inspiration for the opening fill for question 67 and 68? That. It's just simple triplets. There was really no. I've stolen that so um, many You times. know, I don't know. I, I honestly said, I just basically, they wanted to pick up Phil. And I, I just said, how about this? Because it led, it, it really led, musically led into the song. Well, yeah. Yeah, such a great, great song. Such a yeah, great, I love great, that great song. song. I love it too. The the feel to me is really simple. It's just. Yeah, it's but it's it's so tasty and and like you say, it just it it, it leads right into the song perfectly. Um, Eggy Eggy says this is the most strange interview I ever saw. <laughs> Yeah, we like to shake why? things up here, Eggy. <laughs> why is it strange? No, I, I, I think he's just being a wise guy. He's being funny. Is he? Um, is he? I love Eggy. Yeah, you know Eggy. He's he's always he's always he's stirring. A great the pot. guy. He's my good buddy. Yep. Um, John Ferraro is asking, heel up or heel down on the bass drum? Heel up. Heel up. Okay. Yeah, I very seldom play with heel down, but if, unless I have to play really soft or. Like in a jazz thing, if I'm feathering, and even if I'm feathering, sometimes what I'll do, because I'm pretty heavy footed, so I don't, is I, I almost like keep the beater ball almost on the, the head and I'm up on my toe. You know, I'm not good. I'm not really good with the heel down. I'm a, I'm a, I've always played because I played rock and R&B and played hard. Yeah. So yeah. I've always been up on my heel up. That's a, yeah. I mean, hey, there's Rick Latham too, by the way. Rick, hey, Rick says hello. Hi, Rick. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say, everybody that I know, like Jr., all the guys that talk about playing heel down, I think, I think Steve Smith might play heel down. Um, he does both. And, and he plays both. Yeah, I know. J I remember Jr. saying that when he went to North Texas State, Ed Sof made him, you know, relearn and play heel down, and it took a while to master it. But once he did, it, you know, it opened a lot of doors. But it's a, it's a long process to, to go from playing heel up to heel down and really getting it it's not going to happen in my lifetime <laughs> yeah <laughs> mine either buddy <laughs> too late baby yeah no there's no way of playing there's no way of, if you got to kick heavy and kick rock really heavy you have to, there's no way of playing heel down and just really you i mean you can get some volume but you're not going to get the volume you get up on your you know when you really slam into the drum and i and i slam pretty hard when i'm you know into overdrive yeah oh yeah absolutely um, what other, what other drummers besides, I know, you know, Gene, I, I knew and, and Buddy, how about, and, and I know Mitch Mitchell, what about like American guys, rock drummers, like was, was, um, Dino Dinelli like mm -hmm. an influence? Yeah. Without a doubt, Dino Dinelli was an influence because yeah. you know, the, the, obviously the, there was the age of Ringo, right? And you, you know, he, he kind of really changed things in, in, in the way he played, you know, match grip. So it was a little bit hard for me to relate to in a sense, because I was traditional and, you know, Gene Krupa and a little flat into a little more, you know, flashier type of playing, you know, more. And Dino kind of filled that, that void for me because um, he played but in those days. He, in those days he played, I believe he played traditional. I think. I think he did. Yeah. Yeah. And, and those early Rascal records. So yeah, Dino was a big influence. I don't know. My, like, I, I always say Saturday in Park, my drum part in Saturday in Park was like a tribute to Dino Dinelli, you know? Um, it really was. Wow, I never thought uh, of that. Yeah, excuse me. But I, I, I ask that because I, I, I definitely hear some similarities in, the, in that, yeah, that a, a, a definitely a schooled approach. Dino always struck me as a guy that, you know, a rock drummer that had a very real schooled approach to playing like really yeah you know real obvious a sunny, almost a sunny pain approach you know yeah so yeah yeah so know, Dino, um, uh, obviously how blaine was a, was a big influence um you know the, the james brown guys you know uh were really big influences for me the r&b like the the motown guys were huge influences on me yeah um, muriel and um Pistol Pete, is that his name? The guy who played a lot of the cool stuff um, on Motown? Who is, yeah, there's a... Um, 
Uriel Jones, I believe, was the guy yes. yep. that I got to know really well. Um, but there's another guy, Pistol, and he because Uriel, he said he was more of a jazz guy, you know, and you could hear it, you know, in his playing. Some of the shuffles, great shuffles. Joe Dukes was a drummer, not rock, but a guy mm -hmm. who had, had a lot of influence. You know, and then some of the guys that were local to Chicago that no one's ever heard of, you know? That, sure, um, yeah. Other great yeah. drummers, you know? There was a guy by the name of Dwight Kalb, and you know, he doesn't get enough, he was, he was a big influence on myself and uh, I don't, I don't know if you know Ross Salamone. He's a great drummer. Ross Salamone is a Chicago guy from my right from the same neighborhood as me. There was four drummers from my neighborhood that were yeah. all, you know, I, I would say really, really fine drummers. And I, myself, Ross Salamone, Bobby Rafino, and John Siomas. John Siomas. He's from Chicago? Yeah. He's from my neighborhood. We hung out oh. together. John Siomas played on Frampton Alive. He played all those yeah. wonderful things Love you know, at Frampton. Yeah. yeah, really great feel. But if you listen, played. he's got that feel and it was, it was from this. And, and Dwight Kelb was like the first of us. We are kind of, and he was influenced by Clayton Fulliard, uh, James Brown's original drummer. So yeah. Yeah. There's, there, there's the legacy of it, you know, that, but Dwight Kelb, and he just passed away, unfortunately, but he, and then he stopped playing drums a long time ago. What a great drummer he was. Oh, I'm but, sure, you know, yeah. Um, I'm still really good friends with Ross Alamone and Bobby Rufino. And he just had a major influence on us, the way he played R&B and rock, you know? Yeah, yeah. By the way, uh, my buddy Jim Mola said it's Pistol Allen, I think is the guy you were yeah, trying yeah. to think of, Pistol Allen. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, just to back up for a second, you know, I thought, I don't know why, I thought John uh, Sayomos was from New York. And I just kind of, I no. think maybe that's because that's where he ended up living. But and he, he migrated. Yeah. But it's kind of a funny story. I got offered a gig with a band called the Chicago Loop. They had one hit. Uh, they were like a folk rock kind of band. And they were going to New York. And I, I passed it on to John because I didn't want to leave. My, I, didn't want, I, I would have ended up leaving what would have been Chicago. So it was great that I didn't. But I got offered the gig. And I passed it on to John and he took it. And I went to New York and he, it was the, the, the gig fell out in, in, a, in just a short period of time. He was sleeping on park benches and stuff. And then he ended up with, um, you know, the producer, Bob Crew and uh, Mitch Ryder. He ended up playing with Mitch Ryder, so I think with Mitch Ryder. And then he, then he ended up at Frampton. And it was a, yeah. He was, a, he was a really great person. It was a tragic loss. He died way too young of, of an overdose, I, I believe. You know, and what a great drummer. He had a great he, he was great then, and we were all different. Every one of us was different. Yeah. Like Bobby yeah. Rafino was ultimate funk drummer, and Ross was more, he was funk and rock, but he was also a really good jazz player. And I was kind of a combination of everything, you know? Um, and and the Dwight Cowell was funk, amazing funk, and I mean, rock, and played with that, that but he played with that heavy foot and strong bass drum and backbeat. Uh, but with sophistication, he had a great yeah, feel. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, but he yeah. also had sophistication. So it was a really great culture we had of drummers. You know, re, you know, pedigree of drummers just right in the, from the same neighborhood. You know, wow. same you know, five, uh, three mile area. You know, we were all from the northwest side of Chicago. You know, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's I, I don't even find that unusual because I feel like you know back kind of in those days, there were so many musicians and so many kids taking up instruments that it wouldn't be on you. In my town, I, there were a bunch of drummers in my high school class, you know, and, um, you know, even in a small town, you know, there are a, a bunch of us that all knew each other and were sort of rivals as kids, but then, you know, we all liked each other and respected each other. And um, Yeah, there were so many places to play as well. That's the thing, exactly, Danny. Yeah, exactly, there were places to play. Um, a couple of folks, our buddy Carlos Guzman is is um, asking you yeah, to talk yeah. about your time at Caribou Ranch, which which oh. I was going to get to. I was just going to, I know we're, we're kind of running up to almost an hour here, so I won't keep you too much longer, but I thought we'd talk a little bit about just making some of those great records. And I know um, so many great ones came from-, from Yeah, that was a great, that was a spawning ground for many great records. And 
it was such a great great sounding room right it was a great facility um yeah. the whole thing i mean you know they're big the ranch all the cabins you know it was a whole community yeah, uh, yeah. and that's what gercio wanted that's what jimmy gercio he wanted a creative community in the mountains of colorado which was you know pretty adventurous I mean, and and visionary yeah. You know, it was the first, the very first destination studio. So, um, but it was the room, the room itself, you know, it was built in the style of the older day, really dead, right? Very dead. The drums were very, you know, yeah. dead. Yeah. And they sound good. If you listen, it really sounds good. They sound There's so great. much separation, you know? Yeah. But it was, it was very, it was, it was like the Westlake audio and, Anybody who knows those studios knows that those in those days that studios were not very alive. Now, I don't, I you know, th then they went very, then they went live, really live. You know, big, tall rooms, high ceilings, a lot of reflective sur surfaces. But uh, we made a lot of great records there, and it was a, it was a great for me, and I'm sure everybody else. You know, obviously you don't appreciate it at the time because you're young and stupid. Um, but I had a horse up there. I had a beautiful horse. So I didn't do drugs and, and alcohol. So I was kind of like the early riser. And then I'd fade out when everybody would just start partying. I'd be going to bed. And so I had a horse. So, so I'd get up probably, you know, probably two, three hours before everybody. And it wasn't necessarily that early, but I'm saying I'd, I'd get up at, 8 30 or 9 or 9 you know whereas everybody would be 12 or 1 you know mm -hmm. most people and so i'd get them i'd get on the horse and i'd go ride and it was just a great great experience because he had it was a it was a three thousand acre ranch i mean that's i don't know i don't you know as far as a mile how many square miles that is but i mean you you couldn't it would be hard for me to ride from one end to the next in a day you know yeah, yeah. um but it was the studio was beautiful. It was world class. The food was great. I mean, you know, they had a um, they had a uh, a cook, you know, like in a, in a, in like a, a mess hall, you know, where everybody yeah. would. I guess that's what they call it. I mean, you know, I'm a city <laughs> kid, so I wasn't used to that stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, it it was it was. I mean, it, 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 beautiful wildlife. It was, and then of course. Last call would be in Boulder. Boulder was the closest to anything, and we'd 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 run down there for last call or try to you know, that's an hour was an hour drive. Crazy, mm. yeah, that's crazy. But we made a lot of great records. A lot of people made great records there. What was Wind and Fire, Weldon John, Joe Walsh, Super Tramp. I yeah. mean, many yeah. more and many more. So. Great records, great like you said, great sounding records too. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, we were talking about old days and and um, and feeling stronger every day. Was that made? Caribou? Yeah, Caribou? that's yeah. Caribou. Okay. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I mean, I, to yeah. me, that's still I hear that song. It, it, the drum sound on that song holds up better. Yeah, than, I mean, yeah, yeah. It it it's a really um, organic, compressed, and, really compressed, and kind of it's got that it's got a very English, almost English sound, you know. Yeah. And yeah. What we were, what I was going for. Yeah, you're. I, you're. I mean, I. The, the cymbals definitely sound compressed, but but they sound or natural too. Do you know? What I mean? Yeah. They don't sound. No, like... there was. Yeah, it was. It was a great engineer. His name was Wayne. I think it was Wayne Tarnowski. Who was the engineer? He did a great job. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. What? What? Are, uh, do you have any um, memorable parts that you've come up with? Are there some songs that you, you know, you look back at and and think. You know, I mean, I, I know you're a humble guy, but I mean, just in, in terms of like some songs that you're just more proud of than others in terms of. Well, the parts old days and, is old days is one that's a really, I think, a really well thought out, and but a good, a really compliment, great complimentary, and yet it's pretty adventurous. Uh, feeling stronger is, is very tasteful. I'm very proud, you know, and at, at the yeah. end, it's two drum kits just building, trying to build and build and build. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, the time. I didn't play with the clicks, so the time kind of rushes around a bit. But in those days, it didn't matter. You know. No. Um, it, it absolutely not. Um, you know, dialogue is a really funky, cool drum part. Um, 
you know, John, there's just a lot of them. Uh, yeah. um, uh, now that you've gone, a song called Now That You've Gone wasn't a hit, but it's a deep cut that has a really great drum intro and, and, and some solo work. Um, I mean, yeah, a lot of great stuff happened at Caribou. Searching So Long is a, searching yeah. so long is a yeah. really tasteful, good... Jimmy Haskell, the string writer, I met with him and he I met him and he told me, he said, you know, a lot of those string parts, I, the syncopation, I wrote it around your fills to match your fills and your feel. It really made me feel good. That's you know? cool. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in searching so long, you can hear it. Yeah. I was going to make like a I'm comment. Playing along with, sounds like I'm playing along with them, but they're actually playing along with me. That's that's really cool. I was just going to yeah. make a comment about old days, too, that I noticed just from listening to it kind of really recently and, and more intently is that I was going to say initially that there are no real cymbal crashes in it, but there are. But there's there's very few. There's like if, if and all the drummers out there, I think if you listen to this song, what's cool about what what I think is so tasteful about old days is that a lot of your fills, instead of ending them with a cymbal crash, you end them on the hi hat with like a hi hat bark. You know, like you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah, they're, they're, it's a it's a really good drum part. I agree. It's I a mean, really I'm, good drum I'm, part. Yeah. yeah. There's another song called uh, Dialogue, which if you listen to the front part of it, there's I don't I don't do any any crashes towards the end in the vamp there's crashes but in in the body of the song and that was because Robert Robert said he was tired of all the crashes it's bother you know it's and so I said okay let me let me try yeah. doing you know instead of coming out of a fill doing a, always doing a crash like you say come back right out of the hi hat or just yeah. arrive yeah really cool really tasty really good stuff um. Those fills on those records are epic, says Jim Mola. I agree. I love I agree. Jim Mola. Say hi to Jim. Hi, Jim. Jim, Danny says hi. I say hi. What's your most favorite snare drum you've had? Rob wants to know. Rob Winter wants to know. Um, well, there's the copper snare, the old Flingeland copper snare that I used on like Saturday in the Park and a bunch of those that era. Then there's um, then there's a deep valley drum shop snare that I used on Hard to Say I'm Sorry and uh, a couple of other things. And then there's a, a snare drum that JMO made for me. Yeah, uh, wood yeah. a wood radio cam, and that thing is beautiful. I have it somewhere. I got you know, and I've recorded a lot of hits with it. Wow. So. Yeah. And then there's a Slingerland metal drum, chrome snare. But the, the you know that, the, and then of course, in the first two albums, there were Dynasonic, Rogers Dynasonic. That's right. Yeah. And I well, forgot about the no, it's drums. it's the first album. Yeah. And then there's that piccolo snare. And I don't know. I think it's a Rogers that I got it at Pro Percussion. The, the Frank Eppolito, I believe that's his name. He was with Pro yeah. Percussion, yeah. right? Yeah. He, I came in there and he said, "You got to check this snare out." And I bought, I checked, I loved it. I brought it to the studio, tuned it. Garcia, and then we used it on pretty much a lot of the second album. It would make me smile. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the it's, and it's a great snare song. That's a great snare. So it's how, you know I I love snare drums and and we know there are they are so important to us. So and then of course DW makes fabulous snare drums. The snare drums that they make I think are yeah. Un, yeah. almost unparalleled as far as how the quality. Uh, I have a copper shell. I have a, a wooden one piece shell. Um, I love the DW drums, the snare drums. So yeah, yep. They've they've come when I when I worked there. I remember that was. Not to, I mean, I don't want to say it was sort of a weakness. They didn't really make a great. This is yeah. in the very beginning of you coming on board too, eighty seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John was really working at trying to kind of get the snare drum right, and he now did. they've, you know, yeah, yeah. That he really has. Yeah. I mean, they've they've become like you know, they're like a all their drums, but the snare drums especially are. Happy. Yeah, well, they're gonna they're coming out. They're gonna do the Radio King, which I can't wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, is there that'll any, be. Yeah. So, that, is that like top secret? That whole 
I guess it. I mean, I don't. I don't know that much about it, other than I know that's going to be their first single, and I believe release. I believe is the Radio King. Yeah. Which that would be that would be amazing. I, I can't wait. Yeah, that will be that, and I think that's what everybody's yeah. waiting for yeah. and expecting. Yeah. So, you know that. Yeah, and you'd be the if and when. Guy. I mean, I mean, and another, you know, you you missed Nam last year. If, but would you have missed Nam last year if you'd have known there's not going to be a Nam this year? <laughs> well, I thought about that. Probably not. But yeah. then again, I, I, you know, I know some people that that seem to think they got coronavirus at Nam last year or something really close to it. I've gotten sick the last, I don't know how many years I've gone there. Try as I may, yeah, I mean, not get yeah. sick. It's hard enough to. Yeah. yeah, a few people said they they got so sick after this past Nam show that they think they might have had some strain of it. Yeah. So, well, anyway. it's not going to be, you know, again, we're going to, we're going to have one. Unfortunately, we're going to have a year without NAM. Hopefully it's just one year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope so too. Because I, I always so. love, NAM is crazy. And there's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like overkill. It's over. You, I mean, your senses are over, over, you know. I know, I know, but it's, it's great to see you and, and all the guys. And that's like my only time now that I get to see you guys is when I go. Yeah, I mean, it is. It, 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 and the, the, your dinner, your annual dinner is always a great event. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. We drink yeah. a little wine. We eat a little food. Yeah. We hang out. My son talks about that because he's been to a few of these annual yeah. dinners. He, he remembers one with you and Steve and Peter and, and, uh, and it was a great hang. Have you ever talked about uh, on your, your show how, how I've accused you of dyeing your hair? <laughs> no, I haven't. I mean, but you, you can't accuse me anymore. Well, I still think you probably do some little coloring. You know, I do a little bit here. I mean, to be honest, and, and and of course, my I've been I've been my coronavirus. I'm just taking a clipper these days to my. But it, you know, it looks you know, good. I think you know one thing that's great about these Facebook Live deals, Zoom, is the honesty that comes across and. So I think you should admit to, the, I think you should admit to the audience that you do you 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 were dyeing your hair up until Kelly said to you you got to stop dyeing your hair because you're getting the dye, uh, the bathtub and everything. Is that true? Is that I got I, I got to share with everybody. This has been an this has been an ongoing thing with me and Danny for twenty, maybe thirty it, years now. I don't it's know. A long time. <laughs> a long time. He, yeah. he would come up to me, and go Johnny, come on, we're friends. Come on. Just, Admit it, you dye your hair. Come on, just. And I swear I don't. I would tell you. Would you? I, of course, I would tell you. All right, all right, okay. I, won't. I got a lot of gray, Danny. It's, it's you know. Yeah, I don't like all that hair. You, you, that's it. Who needs? I'm glad I don't have it now. I'd have to get haircuts. I know it's a pain. It's a pain in the yeah. ass. This yeah. is this is. I got a big birthday coming up this year. You know. Sixty. So sixty, in December. Wow. Yeah. So. Okay. Well. Are you? We have to do something virtually or whatever. We got to do something. That would be great. That would be great. That would be, we'll do something virtually. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll show off our gray chest hair to each other. <laughs> you know, you're getting old when you get this much gray hair in your chest. When you got this more chest hair than head hair, pisses this me off. This thing's going off the rails quick. Uh, Iggy said this is the weirdest interview. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, Jim Turner. Jim Turner is asking if you will play new Slingerland, drum, Slingerland drums when they come out. And that's a really yes. good question. You yes. will. Yes. And he says, I, yes, you heard it I here said, first, I, folks. I, I threatened them. I said, you better make sure I'm one of your first artists. Well, that, they said, that makes They said they sense. wouldn't have it any other way. So yeah. I'm going to hold them. We'll have to hold them to their word, huh? Yeah. But what a perfect fit. That's perfect. I love it. No, no. I, I was yeah. so... They invited me, you know, uh, Chris Lombardi bought it for his father's birthday, which I thought was, so he, he actually, he invited me to LA because I moved, I was in Vegas at that time. And Don, and we surprised Don and they, they yeah. found a, I think they found a Gene Krupa kit. I think it's a Gene Krupa kit. I think it's a bunny old, kit. I, I saw the yeah. video of it. And I, I think it's a Gene kit, but I'm not a hundred percent certain. And so I got to play it and it's wonderful. I mean, and it was such a great, to me, Slingerland has meant so much. It, it's were they my favorite drums? Well, they they were amongst my and I made did some great work on it. But their factory was close to my house. I grew up with Gene yeah. Krupa and then Buddy 
And I, I actually went to Slingle and after I kind of, and I went, I said, I, that's, I want to play your drums. And they said, okay, they treated me like, like a stepchild for a long time until they came to a concert and it was like a hundred thousand people. And they said, oh boy, I think we better be nice to this guy. Cause you know, they, they, they were like, buddy, if you weren't buddy rich, they treated you like horse shit. Yeah. So, yeah. But they're, they're wonderful company and, and I love them. And I'm so pleased that, that they're, they're back that G, the DW is going to bring him back and give him life again. I, I think it's That's important. Great. I think it's great. I do too. You know, I'll just say this that I, I don't want to talk out of school and, and, uh, and, and speak ill of, of old Slinger, but I've, I've heard enough stories from Armin and Lenny back in the day because they were, you know, friends with Bud Slingerland and the, and the Slingerland folks and Ludwig. And they said exactly what you said is that they, at the time, they felt like, you know, Gene was still alive, although he was older, but they had Buddy and they had Gene and they kind of felt like we don't really need anybody else. We don't, you know, and I think once, once the Beatles happened, yeah, and, and Ludwig really exploded by the mid '60s. They kind of woke yeah. up a little bit. They had to, and, and that's that's when they pursued yeah. me, or when I actually I pursued them, and they said, "Yeah, but yeah, they were good to me." After that, once once they realized that they, were, you know, that I had something to give, something to offer, uh, but it's okay. It was all good. Yeah. It was a great experience, yeah. and I'm glad they're back. I, I can't wait till uh, you know DW does their first release of drums. Great. You gonna play some concert toms too? Maybe like replicate um, some of those old kits yeah probably or, i mean yeah uh, i i really i like double-headed you know uh, concert times are good i like i like to have an i like to have in a set that was a combination of the two to be honest yeah yeah so, anyway. cool danny well this has been great i was just going to say um pat, pat brown says 60 <laughs> say it ain't so <laughs> um I was just going to say what somebody here, Anthony uh, Kushina, Kushina, my good buddy, who's at all these little hangs, mentioned John uh, Siomos, that Peter Frampton found him in a studio. And my Stanley Sheldon, who was Frampton's bass player, a longtime bass player, who could be watching this right now, for all we know, had told me that he heard John Siomos play on Todd Rundgren's Hello, It's Me. And that mm -hmm. was kind of what made him want to bring him in his band. So. Um, Great. I didn't even yeah. know that John played on Hello, It's Me. I, but uh, it, it, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, that's uh, such a great tune. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he was he's a, he was such a tasteful, great drummer, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and you know, being from that same neighborhood, having that, that rich, the richness of influences, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Danny, I won't keep you. I know you've, you've had a long day. Um, I do want to remind everybody to Check out Danny at the Modern Drummer Festival Virtual MD Festival, September the 12th, which is not only Neil Peart's birthday, it's my daughter's birthday. My daughter oh, awesome. will be 31. You met my daughter years ago. I, I, I know, 31, wow. Yeah, I know. And you have a daughter named Danielle also. I do, she's, not, she's, she's a bit older, 47, I think. Wow, I remember meeting her when she was really young. I was just wow. visiting, she's a great, great person. She's a great, great person. Well, Johnny D, I love you, man. And um, love you too, buddy. It was a lot of fun. We could probably go for another two hours. It's easy, but you you give you do this you do this so well. Let's do it again. I, I loved it. We would do it, we will do it again. We had some good questions and some good folks watching. And yeah, um, Danny, stick around for one more second. I'm going to end the stream and I'll say goodbye to you in the in the Zoom uh, chat. So okay, but you can wave goodbye to everybody. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks um, for tuning in. And Johnny D dyes his hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stay tuned for more shows i got some things up my sleeve so stay tuned everybody and uh thanks for watching thanks danny Bye. peace sit tight for one second danny